Good, good morning uh, and welcome to the uh, this debate on the state of European Green Deal. Uh, just to make sure you're in the right session. Uh, my name is Andre Marcu. I'm the director of the European Roundtable on Climate Change and Sustainable Transition. The topic for today is fit for 55, fit for industrial transition. Uh, it is really very much a debate. It is not intended about long statements. So we, we look forward to a, an active debate. What we'll do is would like to wait for a couple of minutes and always awkward while we, we wait for people to stream in, but we'll wait for a few minutes uh, to uh, uh, for people to, uh, because in principle, we have a very large number of, uh, of attendees and we'll see uh, uh, how many of those attendees actually will show up this morning. There are rules of thumb in Brussels as to the, the numbers that attend. I think, Jörg, you can be a test, uh, can testify to that. So two minutes or three minutes and then we, we move on. Uh, the rules of the game is this is not on Chatham House rules. This is an open, there are, there are journalists on this, 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 uh, uh, this debate. Uh, what we will do, we will have an initial round of, uh, of questions uh, to the panelists. Uh, we'll then, then allow panelists, if there's a debate to, to be had among some of the things that the, the, pal the panelists may, may say. And then uh, we will open it to the, uh, to the floor. Uh, and we will uh, we encourage people to put things on the chat that Michael and I uh, will be monitoring. Uh, and then uh, uh, at the same time, you may raise your electronic arm, we'll recognize you and you'll give you the floor, we'll make you into panelists and give you the floor. But at that time, I would kindly ask all of you not to make long statements, uh, make, if you need to make a preamble, fine, but try and be concise and to the point. So uh, we are now waiting for uh, one more minute uh, for people to come in and then we, we shall start. So uh, I think, Michael, I think we should start again. My name is Andre Marcou. I'm the director of European Roundtable on Climate Change Sustainable Transition. I'm being joined by Michael Melling as a co-facilitator today. Uh, Michael? Good morning. My name is Michael Melling. I'm deputy director of the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research at MIT and have the pleasure of serving on the board of ERCSD. Very well, and what we have here today with us is, is a, indeed a very distinguished panel, and we thank you all. I, we know these are the, uh, you know, uh, busy times uh, where we operate in, in, you know, one year later, we still operate in new ways. Uh, Monsieur Eric Maillard, who is a, a Senior Vice President, EU Affairs Diplomatic Advisor to the CEO. Uh, he has been in the diplomatic service of, of France before in, in, in different position. Uh, Judith Kirton Darling, Deputy Secretary General, Industrial Old European Trade Union, responsible for industrial trade policy, social dialogue, and horizontal networking, formerly a British member of the European Parliament. Uh, Mr. Javier Goni Del Caccio, who is the CEO and President of Fertiberia and Chairman of Fertilizers Europe, uh, formerly with, uh, for many years with, with McKinsey and Company in, in Madrid. Mikhail Staffas, Chairman of Eurometo, President and CEO of Boliden. Uh, then uh, Mr. Simone Mori, who is the head of Europe in the NL group. Uh, prior of that, he had uh, and continues to have many uh, other hats, but has covered uh, managerial position in uh, regulation, antitrust, environmental, climate change policy and innovation in the NL group. Mr. Isodoro Miranda, who is the CEO of La Parche Holes in Spain, Vice President of SEM Bureau, and formerly President of the Spanish Cement Association. Last but not least, uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Georg Zachman, uh, who is uh, with one of the probably the leading think tank in Brussels, Bruegel, and welcome to, uh, to, to uh, hear uh, uh, Georg. He has, he's currently doing uh, advisory work in, in Eastern Europe, in, in, in Ukraine and, and, and Belarus and other countries. So welcome. Now, the topic of the day is 
fit for industrial transition, fit for 55. And the reason why we do this at this time is that it is indeed an important moment. We are in the middle of a revolution. This is not for the faint of heart. This is a revolution where changes in industry, in the economy of Europe, in the society of Europe is taking place. And how we come out of this, and we come out of this is going to be not only what the economy looks like, but what society would look like at the end of it. What can we be expected from the Fit for 55 package with respect to industrial decarbonization? That's important. Why? Because we have so far dealt with uh, the power industry. I think we haven't finished that, that job, but we're all, way, all well on the way. We know I'm an electrician. I'm a lapsed electrician, but I'm an electrician. Spent 20 years on Ontario Hydro. I know a little bit about electricity. So I think we're on the, on the road there. Industry, we're at the beginning of the road. It's something new. So what is missing from what is known? We have a package. What is the role of carbon pricing? What is the role of carbon pricing in the context of the whole European Green Deal? I was listening yesterday to Clement Fuss, the president of the IFO Institute for Economic Research in Munich, who had very serious doubts about the green, green taxonomy, and I was actually arguing for a stronger ETS. So these are, there were very, very strong words being exchanged between him and a number of member of parliament. So this is a serious debate that will take us somewhere. Electrification and the role of different technologies in industrial decarbonization by 2030 and beyond. Uh, what, how to best address just transition? Is just transition really an add-on? You know, kind of go talk to the guys with the just transition fund, or is this really something intrinsic? We have gone, we have gone through transition in Europe over the last decades. Some of it poorly managed, some of it not managed at all, with result, disastrous results in some cases for a whole generation in Eastern Europe. It, it's reality, is not something. So we are on an important mission, but we need to know exactly how we do this. So with this, what I would like to launch the debate is the first question. And I would ask all of you to, uh, to start by, by kind of responding to or uh, reflecting on this question. A decarbonized industrial and prosperous Europe. Is this all what we all want that? From what we know about the package that's about to come in, the Fit for 55 package, which yesterday was very interesting. We heard from one of the member of parliament actually may not come in July. I'm not sure it's true or not, but that's what we're hearing sometime. We hope not. Is, does it fulfill that? Does it fulfill that role? So I'll start with Monsieur Maya. Uh, will you please start? Thank you, Andre, and, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. It's uh, actually, it's a difficult question and there is no uh, silver bullet uh, to decarbonize the industry. Uh, you, I think you've rightly uh, recalled that the power industry, it's, it's an industry, I think we can come back to that later, but already um, uh, started and is, is on the right path of its own decarbonization. Uh, and this is the, the, the main reason why uh, we, as a, a power industry, we believe that electrification, both direct and indirect, um, is a, a, a no regret uh, solution. So, so why and how, so to say, and, and how the Fit for 55 package can contribute to that, or what are the conditions for the Fit for 55 to contribute to this? Well, first, on the, on the why aspect of, uh, of direct electrification, I think uh, the, the first, and it is a good news, the first point is it is, a, it is feasible. Uh, there is a study from Euroelectric saying up to 50% uh, of um, uh, industry uh, processes uh, can, can be uh, electrified. Um, just one example uh, with high temperature um, heat pumps to replace uh, fossil fuel uh, heating system, for example. Uh, this is especially true in uh, chemistry or agribusiness, but there are people around, around this table who, who are much more competent than I am uh, to, to give you uh, more technical details on that. Second, it is an urgent matter. It's not only feasible, it is urgent. And for one, uh, I, I would say simple reason is there is a real risk of a locking effect here if you do not 
electrify uh, quickly, uh, then you will have embarked into a process that will last for 30, 40, 50 years uh, for, uh, I would say, obvious reasons, because when we invest in, in industry uh, processes, uh, it lasts for, for a very long time. Um, the third uh, aspect of, of the electrification being a, a, a a no regret option, so to say, it's because it has positive uh, spillover effects. Because besides the uh, the fact that electricity is already and will be more and more uh, uh, CO2 free without uh, em without uh, uh, emitting uh, CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, it has spillover positive spillover effects. The first one is energy uh, efficiency. In some uh, industries, electric solutions such as uh, heat pumps of hybrid boilers can be between 100% up to 300% more uh, energy efficient than um, uh, for low temperature grade, sorry, uh, than their uh, gas uh, equivalent. Uh, it, uh, I must say also that you, you, can, uh, you can have a lot of energy efficiency uh, with heat recovery for industrial processes. We, for example, we have done that in the, the eastern part of France for an automotive uh, industry. We, we are heating the city of uh, Sochaux uh, near a Peugeot uh, factory plant by using the, uh, uh, the uh, energy uh, and the blast furnaces uh, of, of, of the plant. And, and the, the, the last point uh, to, uh, to, um, to complete that with indirect electrification for hard to abate, uh, sector. The good news here is, is also that we, we have technical uh, solutions to produce low carbon uh, hydrogen, we, both uh, using renewables or uh, with electrolyzers connected to the grid if uh, there is um, uh, a low carbon energy mix, low carbon electricity mix. This is the case in Sweden or, or in France, for example. So it, it's uh, feasible. Uh, urgent. Uh, it is also uh, positive, but uh, what do you need in the Fit for 55 to, to foster this uh, transformation? I would say uh, at least three things. The first one is you must support the competitiveness of uh, electricity. Today, electricity is more taxed than uh, fossil fuels. Uh, in France, for example, uh, based on uh, statistics from the uh, National uh, Statistical Office, uh, if you, um, uh, an industrial will pay 25 euro per megawatt hour for, for gas and 60 uh, euro per, per megawatt hour for, for electricity. So you see the, you, you see the difference. Then, um, so that, that can be done with, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot in the member states' hands, but I think the energy uh, uh, taxation directive is, um, is a key uh, tool also that will be um, uh, revised. Second is uh, a steady foreseeable uh, CO2 pricing with a level playing field because, and, and to be really blunt and candid, uh, the industry is a major client for a company like uh, EDF. Uh, so uh, we, we, we do not want to, uh, there is a, a need for level playing field and CBAM here, the carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism is uh, of course extremely important. We want to keep these clients uh, on the European soil, but also to have jobs uh, in Europe. Otherwise, uh, the, uh, the Green Deal and the Fit for 55 will not be uh, supported by, uh, by uh, citizens. Um, and I think that's the third point. It's also important to support the scaling up of, the, uh, of some innovative processes. Uh, it is especially true for uh, electrolyzers. And there we need also uh, money supporting uh, innovation. That's, uh, I don't want to, to, to be uh, any longer. And I just to, to add um, uh, a conclusion to that. This direct electrification is a, is a mean, it's not uh, 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 an objective uh, per se, obviously not, but we fully believe and that it is extremely uh, efficient and cost effective. And that's why it should be the priority. So the, the answer to your question, the Fit for 55 will support the decarbonization of the industry if it supports the most cost effective solutions to decarbonizing the, uh, the industry. Thank you. So cost effectiveness. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Maya. Judith. 
Yeah, thank you very much for um, the invitation to be part of this panel um, this morning. Obviously, we're as um, industrial workers, uh, Industrial Europe represents uh, about 7 million workers across 38 countries in manufacturing, mining and energy. So um, every part of the Fit to 55 uh, package will have an impact um, on some of our members in different ways, um, both challenges and um, opportunities, I would say. And so we are we are watching um, extremely closely uh, the, the development of this package, I guess for us, much of the debate is focused um, on targets, on what percentage will be in this proposal, what percentage will be in that proposal. From our perspective, uh, we focus much more on the how um, rather than uh, the, the number, if you like. Um, and that brings me to um, the three things which are really vital in our view in relation to the upcoming package to ensure that we, we deliver what Franz Timmermans promised when he launched the Green Deal, which was a Green Deal transforming the European economy with a just transition for workers and communities affected. So to come back to your opening um, statement, uh, Andre, should the just transition be an add-on or intrinsic. Um, it won't surprise you to, for me to say that for the trade union movement, uh, the just transition should be an intrinsic uh, red line through all of the proposals within the Fit to 55 package. And that means three key things for us. The first is that in our view, the package has to be coherent with an ambitious European industrial strategy. Uh, we've just had the publication of the updated strategy, not as ambitious as we would have liked to have seen, considering the scale of challenge that we face. Um, some of the points that um, Eriki was talking about, about the, um, the, the need to get this right now, we have uh, effectively a decade uh, to set Forth, particularly in energy intensive industries, um, the investment to guarantee that clean production right to 2050. We're talking about one investment cycle in many of our sectors. So um, it's absolutely vital that we have the whole uh, package integrated with um, a strong industrial strategy. One of the innovations in the updated industrial strategy was the proposal to have these sectoral or ecosystem roadmaps co-designed with the stakeholders in the sectors. And we think that in order to create um, a transition which is about transformation and not about disruption, um, avoiding all of the social, the negative social impacts of disruption, that roadmap um, co-designed co with the stakeholders is absolutely crucial, underpinning um, the, uh, the legislative framework at European um, level. In the second point is how do we do that? Well, one of the key elements um, is about mainstreaming social dialogue. At the moment, um, we talk about just transition as if it's something completely new. But as you said, we've been through many transitions in our sectors, in different regions across Europe. At the nuts and bolts, this is about a, a comprehensive framework for anticipation and management of change. And that cannot be assumed that that will happen in a kind of organic way. It has to be um, properly resourced. It has to have a framework around it. And it can't be reduced just down to a question of skills. It's not just about skills, it's about actual strong social um, dialogue, negotiation with the communities um, and the workers affected and using the tools that we have. We have sectoral social dialogue committees. Um, we negotiate with Euroelectric, uh, for example, in the electricity sector or with Eurogas in the gas sector, with Eurofair in the steel sector. We have these structures at European level. They are underutilized um, in the context of, um, of climate action. We also have European works councils, negotiations around the transition um, in companies. So social dialogue has to be right at the center. And the third element is about inequalities. The risk of this package is, and that's what we hear from our members, is that we will see a fragmentation across Europe. Leader regions, laggard regions, leader um, uh, sections of society, and laggard sections of society. That is corrosive for the future of Europe. And there are major political risks if we allow that fragmentation 
uh, to, to take hold. So we need uh, to ensure that um, the European framework is promoting investment across the board. Um, that means a reinforcement of some of the financing instruments. For example, in the ETS review, we need to see far more um, earmarking of funds into the innovation fund and into the just transition fund to ensure that there is that European frame of solidarity within uh, this transition. It's not just about coal regions, it's also vital in most manufacturing regions. Take the automotive sector as an example. We have regions in Central and Eastern Europe where 95% of the companies operating are headquartered elsewhere outside the country. The decisions are not made locally. If you don't have a regional framework bringing together the different actors with proper resources, then you risk um, real problems. And finally, it's about where the jobs are going to be created. The differences in where jobs are going, where jobs are being created, which demands an enormous industrial scale scale, upskilling and reskilling agenda at European level. And, and that means strong coordination um, and has to be mainstreamed throughout this Fit to 55 package. I'll stop there um, to ensure that we have lots of uh, time for everybody else, but they are three key points for us. We'll come back to that, Judy, very important. Javier. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Andre. Well, uh, for us, for the fertilizer industry, actually, the Fit for uh, 55, we see, it, we see it as a great opportunity to drive the needed uh, transition towards uh, the zero emissions that we all want. And this moment of the de definition is, of course, crucial uh, because it will impact our industry in the years to come. And only if we have the right framework, then uh, the real decarbonization uh, will be achieved. Um, the fertilizer industry is clearly committed to play our part uh, and, and, and to do our contribution to this uh, new zero emission uh, target. Um, and we are actually designing our, our path, our pathway eh, to get there. Mm. And for that, the production of uh, green ammonia and blue ammonia, in our view, will play a key role in this sense. Green ammonia will be not only important for uh, fertilizers to be able to produce green fertilizers, but also it will, be a, it will play, in our view, a significant role as a fuel for deep sea shipping and as also as an energy career uh, for hydrogen. In short, uh, we believe that uh, green ammonia uh, can become the workhorse of the hydrogen economy in the future. So we are very enthusiastic. However, in our view, in order to play this role, eh, the fertilizer need, industry needs a package of a policy, financial and regulatory support to overcome, first of all, the high, the high cost of investments. We are estimating that the industry will need to invest between 30 and 35 billion in order to achieve a full a real decarbonization. And the second, to uh, avoid not to lose, not to lose competitiveness at the global market in the international markets. And, and that, that is extremely important because fertilizers are traded across continents and, and are traded all around the place. We're competing with China, we're competing with the Middle East, and we need to be able to have an industry that is that on one side is able to transition to this new green economy, but on the other side that we, that can continue living and competing in the in the global in the global market. So for that, in order to achieve that, basically we need some type of carbon leakage protection, and if not, uh, we will not get there. Eh? And for that, uh, in our view, the revision of the ETS and the revision and the proposal for CBAM are going to be extremely important eh, in that sense. We need, first of all, predictability and stability. Okay. Uh, now, it is very difficult to judge whether new investments in new, uh, for instance, in new plants can be done because uh, still the, 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 uh, we don't have enough, enough uh, vision of uh, how it's going to be the outcome and how, how we are going to be able to compete with, with the rest. Uh, so we need to achieve a level playing field internationally in order to, uh, to stay competitive and in order to continue providing the support that we are providing to the European agriculture. Eh? And getting, getting a bit more into uh, the details, I mean, we need a, a CBAM that basically protects the industry. And that's key. Eh? Uh, first of all, we need a CBAM that, it's, uh, that can, can, uh, can live with the, with the, uh, and can coexist with the current system of uh, free allocation. Eh? If, uh, uh, that is uh, very important in our side. Second, we need a CBAM that actually covers the full sector and doesn't allow other people elsewhere to circumvent this uh, mechanism, we need to understand that this should cover 
100% of the nitrogen imports, not only a few products, and then two thirds or, or three quarters of the imports being, uh, uh, being, uh, uh, being outside of this uh, system. We need clearly the CBAM to cover not only upstream, but especially downstream products, because downstream is the, is the way in which most imports come into the European Union in order to avoid uh, these market distortions. And also we need some, 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 some protection or some, some mechanisms to protect the ability to export of the European industry, okay? In case that we are competing in other places with, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, players that are in, in a different, different situation. So basically we need something that is comprehensive, that, is, uh, that addresses all, all the different issues, that is predictable, and that is, uh, and the changes are gradual, linear, so that the industry can adapt. We cannot go for sudden changes because uh, that will clearly harm the European employment and the European industry. Of course, uh, you mentioned uh, carbon pricing is, is raising up. Carbon pricing, of course, will, will, will be a clear incentive eh, to achieve this decarbonization, but alone will not trigger the deployment of, all, of clean technologies in the, in, the, in the industry sector at the scale. And, and might penalize uh, our industry on, on global markets, uh, which could also lead to, industry, to uh, some type of uh, investment leakage. Um, also, a, another point is that if we're gonna produce green fertilizers and green ammonia, we need, a, some type, uh, we need quickly some type of certification process for these uh, uh, green fertilizers or green ammonia so that we can market them uh, clearly as green fertilizers and we can develop a market for them uh, with uh, different prices than, than, than uh, uh, standard fertilizers. Uh, if at the end of the day, uh, we don't achieve uh, higher prices for these green fertilizers, then, then uh, it's gonna be very difficult to achieve the, 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 to achieve the, the business case. Eh? And we need to understand that, that now uh, producing uh, hydrogen, producing gray hydrogen is easily uh, uh, one third or one fourth or one fifth the cost of producing green hydrogen. Eh? So uh, either we obtain a higher revenues from our green products, or if not, uh, it will be impossible uh, to, to cover the bridge, the bridge. Because it is very important for us to be able to have a business case that works, a business case that doesn't kill companies. Uh, and we need to address all of that. And, and of course, if we're talking about being producing a green hydrogen and green ammonia, everything that was said before about the, 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 the needed for a cheap electricity and mass electrification, that, that's of course, that's a clear condition. That's a clear condition. So uh, this is our view. We want to stay competitive at a global level. We want to go uh, for, uh, for our uh, green targets, uh, but we need some type of uh, level playing field and support for this uh, initial, uh, to, so that this initial development happens and it takes the speed uh, that we want to really achieve a decarbonized fertilizer sector. Thank you, uh, Javier. Uh, Mikael, you, you are the, uh, also chairman of, of Eurometo, which, which has been a very strong voice in, in Brussels. Uh, I'm quite keen to hear your intervention. Well, thank you very much. I hope you hear me well. We hear you. Uh, well. Good. Uh, being, you know, you're a metal and being in the non ferrous metal business is, of course, very interesting at these times. Uh, just to be very clear, all the paths that all the other industries are using, as we've heard before today, are all involving electrification. And electrification uh, will need base metals and other metals as well, non ferrous metals. And not only do we need it because we're going to produce more electricity, we also need more non-ferrous metals because we're going to produce um, renewable electricity and you can see from all kind of data that that requires even more metals. So in one way we are in the industry that needs to grow immensely in order to secure the supply that everybody else needs for the transition and I always ask everybody in these kind of situation please add up the material the metal need that you will need in terms of copper, zinc, nickel, lead and so on in order to be able to to achieve this transition. So um, therefore I'm saying, can, can we get there? If starting with the big answer, can we get there? Yes, I think so. But just be aware everybody that in order for everybody else to succeed, we will need to be able to uh, get a lot more of base metals into the European situation, non ferrous metals into the European stage. Now, having said that, you also know that these metals very much float around and we have a real issue of carbon leakage already before this whole debate started. It depends a little bit on where in the value chain you are, 
Uh, but if you start at the beginning of the value chain, Europe is only 20% self-sufficient in terms of mining and sourcing these metals that we're talking about. As you move up the value chain through smelters and so on, the, the part of the value add that happens in Europe gets larger. And there are certain parts of the industry that are also exporting out of Europe, even though most people are mainly concentrating the cell in Europe because that's the natural market since there's such a big deficit. This uh, uh, situation has led to a situation where we today have a very significant carbon leakage as a starting point. Uh, you can look into almost any value chain that you want to. You can look into uh, uh, zinc, you can look into nickel and so on, and you'll see that all the metals that come from outside Europe have a much higher carbon footprint than the metals in Europe. So not only do we, in order to get a, a prosperous carbon-less Europe, we have to start with thinking about the whole value chain and all the CO2 emission that happens outside the borders in order to supply the metals that we need. We are, however, uh, very optimistic that we can work on our part as well. And I usually say that we only need three things and they're relatively okay. We need to level playing field. The industry as such in Europe is, is quite competitive. We just need to make sure that it's level playing field and it's not today. And we've seen that already with several parts of the industry going outside Europe the way it is already today. The second thing that we need is a little bit of respect that we have very long investment cycles. Uh, this is, a, as many others, a very heavy investing industry, and we need to have some respect for that in order to be able to get the transition. And the third thing that we want, and I think some of the previous speakers have been speaking about this, is that we want Europe to secure a mechanism where we find a market for the low carbon products. If this is through certification, if this is through making sure that you get low carbon specified in all kinds of um, standards that are applying in, in construction and in automotive and so on, uh, or when you get that in and help just to be able to secure that the consumers can choose and then the consumers can do it. That is very important. Now, I don't want to go in too much into the details of what needs to be done. I just want to say that the answer is always that the devil is in the details. There are lots of things that are being proposed uh, that could theoretically be good, but could also be very bad if it's not done in the right way. And therefore you also need to be very careful as you're now moving into potentially replacing some of the securities for carbon leakage with a new system. As you potentially moving into a CBAM, you need to be very careful in letting the um, systems that we have today with free allocations of emission rights and the indirect compensation to stay around until we have a new situation that will in secure the same needs that we have uh, or that we have today to make sure that we have a level playing field. So I think I'll keep it very short uh, and just to be very clear around this, I think that it's doable, but I think just for everybody around that listens to this, it's not gonna happen without non-ferrous metals. And if the non-ferrous metals happens outside Europe, that's gonna be much worse than happening in Europe. So please all everybody help us to make sure that we get rules mm. that gives us a level playing field. Thanks you, Mikkel. I, I... I will betray my, my bias because I think that not only you, but I think a couple of your colleagues before have mentioned what for me is the magic word is a market for low carbon products. It's kind of, it sums the whole thing together. But let me go now to Simone Mori. Uh, NL is a company that I've known for, for decades as, a, as an electrician. It's, uh, uh, is the company that is now seen as the, the green champion in Europe and around the world for electricity. Simone. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, André. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this very interesting debate. And, uh, I was, uh, while listening to this conversation, I was uh, going back in time, and, uh, looking at when we started to work together 15 years ago, more or less. And uh, a part of the discussion was more or less the same, if you want. And what is striking me, I understand all the points. And I think that, for example, looking at, at metals, for example, what Michael was saying, it's very important. But looking at the evidence that we got, at least for the many weapons that have been carried out and prepared, after 15 years of uh, European uh, policies for supporting decarbonization, uh, after many mistakes, because there is here in the chat, there is, for example, yeah, the subsidies for renewable, there were too much, for, of course. We didn't find any evidence of a real carbon leakage phenomenon strictly related to European 
carbon, low carbon policies. Of course, there is a problem of competitiveness. We know very well as electricians, we work, we, we work hardly with the steel sector, we work hardly with the cement sector, we work hardly with aluminum. There are problems of relative competitiveness of Europe related to many things, state aid regulation, the lack of, you know, lack of heavy subsidies, for example, on a specific sector, which is not what happens in China. But uh, I mean, we didn't find me. Maybe you have new reports and you discover something new. We have, we have no evidence, basically, of, of, of a real carbon leakage coming from European decarbonization policy. The evidence is, on the contrary, that, for example, the ATS mechanism, as it has been conceived and applied in time, produced a net, a quite large net benefit on overall, let's say, in a consolidating uh, industrial sector, which is a point. I think is, I, I'm not saying that this is going to be the same for the future, but I think it's a starting point since for at least 15 years, we uh, discussed quite a lot about the disaster that carbon policies in Europe would bring to European industrial sector, which didn't happen. It is a good point, I think. It's, it's not, you know, just in order to demystify the certain point. We, this uh, doesn't mean that we don't have to worry about the future. We have to worry because now the step forward is very strong, is very ambitious, and it's really transformational. So I would say today we work, you know, on the on the uh, let's say on some spot in the large perimeter. Now we are starting from a breakthrough, which is very very relevant. And of course, this is another story, another game. But I think that there is a full awareness that uh, keeping uh, together deployment of technologies with, which may bring decarbonization and the competitiveness of our industrial sector, which is by far the most efficient and the most carbon efficient in the world, are to combine the target that have to be taken together into the, uh, our, our short-term and long-term European vision. Looking at the measures, I, I, I do not believe that, we, that the philosophy, the philosophical approach for the industrial sector has to be different than what we are having for the rest of the European society. We have to deploy technologies which are already mature and that are ready to bring decarbonization as much as possible. I mean, today, uh, despite what has been said in, a, in one of the messages in the chat, there is no way in the world, not only in Europe, to produce, for example, electricity cheaper than renewables once you know, the mechanism and the permitting and blah, blah, blah are properly realized. So it's clear that number one is to create all the conditions for having a cheap renewable electricity production, which is, a, as we know, priority number one, that's the most efficient way to, uh, uh, produce to determine uh, decarbonization in the system. And then, okay, Elki said it very well. Of course, once you have a cheap, uh, zero carbon electricity, you have to electrify it as much as possible through direct electrification. Uh, and, and I think there is a quite important opportunities to be explored also in the industrial sector, as again, as has been said, and to indirect electrification, which is probably a more complex, there is a longer way to go, I think we have to keep in mind very clearly the priorities between what is more or less ready today and what will be ready in a while, which is indirect electrification. I fully share what Aki said. I believe that uh, green hydrogen for tomorrow and uh, optimization of, uh, of uh, let's say, or, of a grid utilization where you have a low carbon footprint to uh, the development of efficient electrolytical process are the two combined strategy. One is more in the short, medium term, the other one is in the long term. Uh, of course, in this field, we've, we must be very careful uh, in order to avoid that uh, we could put in place solutions, technological solutions today, which are not coherent to what we want to achieve in 2050. Low carbon hydrogen is not zero carbon hydrogen. Then it's better to have a low carbon hydrogen than high carbon hydrogen, of course. That's you know it's quite easy statement. But if we do invest in low carbon hydrogen, this is gonna to stay with us in the future. And this is don't create conditions for locking in technological solution that may stay with us when 
we want to reach Nazio and wind up maybe not coherent with Nazio solution. Very uh, final point, as I said, uh, we want to have a competitive uh, industrial sector and uh, a wealthy society, which means that, of course, as our colleagues said, the carbon leakage methods, which worked up today, which worked pretty well up to date, have to be reinforced. I think that what you are saying, a global carbon market or a global market for low carbon products, it's something important. I think that there are more and more the conditions to do that. I think that looking at the global debate, I think that some step forward has been carried out and we have to reinforce this. We have to enforce this because this is a strong, a strong point for Europe, because again, we have the most decarbonized and carbon efficient industry in the world. Second, as I said, this transformation implies a societal approach, which means uh, taking care of regions where some job will be over, creating the conditions for re-employment, for reskilling, for upskilling, but even more, for creating the, the backbone of educating the system in order to get our young people, young generation ready for the revolution. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you, uh, Idoro Miranda. I don't know much about cement to tell you that Idoro, all I know is a ton for a ton. That's kind of the rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm interested to, to hear your reaction. Th thank you, thank you very much. Uh, first on behalf of uh, Semburo and, and Lafarge Holcim, uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to, to, to this uh, panel. And let me correct you, it is not one for one, it's one for point, uh, point eight and, and going down and down uh, and down. So uh, let, let me first, uh, f f make a pledge eh? because I see that we are 300 uh, viewers. So hello to, to, to everyone. Y you know, I mean, sometimes it's the industry, either uh, electricity, metals, that uh, we are finger pointed as heavy emitters. Uh, do you know who are the most heavy emitters? It's all of us. In the shower we took this morning, the, the breakfast, uh, the coffee, the croissant that, uh, that we took uh, this morning. Our lifestyle in our homes is 36% of all the CO2 that gets uh, emitted. Cement, uh, production of, uh, of cement on the contrary in Europe is, is barely four to 5%. But we need to realize of, of, of this uh, responsibility. The cement industry is very much aware of, of, of this impact that, uh, that we have. And already one year ago, in May 20, we, we launched our roadmap uh, towards uh, decarbonization. And why so? It is because, Andre, you, you just uh, mentioned it. Uh, this one for one or one for uh, point eight makes for us uh, CO2 a fundamental part of um, of the equation. I mean, um, we have always been uh, talking uh, with the, the European Commission about how to reduce our, our CO2 uh, uh, footprint. I mean, this uh, is a fact for us because at current prices, I mean, uh, you know that uh, over the last uh, few weeks, uh, already some months, the price of CO2 has gone up above 50 euros, uh, 50 euros uh, per ton. At this price, if you apply this equation of one to one, the fact of the matter is that at a full costing of, of clinker and cement, more than 50% of our cost will be CO2. This has uh, very serious uh, implications because uh, if uh, there is no market, uh, as uh, it was uh, also finger pointed, if there is no market for low carbon uh, products, how do I pass? this uh, cost in, in, uh, into the market. And this is where uh, an industry like us is, is working on uh, improving the energy efficiency of our plants. But we need also to work with the formulation of, uh, of concrete. We need to work with architects, with constructors to really make sure that at the very end is the full uh, value added change of, of the construction that is oriented towards uh, low, low CO2. But to focus more precisely on fit uh, for uh, for 55, I think uh, Mr. Maya was mentioning we, we need to be ambitious with uh, with the public authority. It's, it's going to be a major step forward towards really uh, getting uh, decarbonization, as I was mentioned, the, the society, but uh, more in particularly in uh, 
in Europe. Let, let me talk about one example that, that, that uh, probably will uh, add a, a, a different point of view of what has been spoken. Carbon capture and storage. I mean, it is very obvious that today our society is carbon oriented and we're gonna be working and it's gonna be investment cycle that needs to be economic incentive, et cetera. But carbon capture uh, and storage is going to be there. Is part of the solution. Let's not uh, be blind uh, up to a point uh, for us, our roadmap towards zero decarbonization was uh, assuming that close to 30, 35% of the CO2 uh, emitted needs to up to a point to, to, be, to be captured. Today, the legislation on, on, on carbon, carbon capture and storage is, is patchy is not uh, very clear. Uh, some countries even, uh, and we need also to work with, with the public opinion that uh, that carbon storage is possible uh, and it is not, uh, not harmful and uh, uh, we need to go for it. But at the same time, uh, we need a, a, a legal framework of how CO2 is accounted for. And, uh, and also the same way that today, we have uh, throughout Europe pipes that bring uh, gas to our own houses, etc. Up to a point, uh, in some industrial hubs, there will be a network of this uh, carbon uh, that, that that will need to be captured, transport, and then be be stored. Uh, and and the same for for some uh, projects of uh, of utilization. I mean, for example, uh, there are several projects uh, developed uh, for, by by our group. In which, for example, uh, we were, we have the West. Turk uh, project in which we want to take uh, this uh, CO2 out of our cement plant and methanize it uh, with green uh, electricity, green energy, and then convert it into fuel that can be uh, a, a, a green uh, a green fuel. And then you you do this. Uh, what is going to be the future in Europe? This circular uh, economy in which nothing is waste. I mean, the CO2 is still part of our equation, but it is constantly and uh, permanently being uh, reduced with the fact of, of green uh, energy. That is going to be, uh, it's going to take time. I mean, many of these solutions, we are at this point in some testing uh, of many of these solutions, probably after the 2030 and with the prices of, of CO2 above 50, there's gonna be an acceleration um, uh, of, of all this. But in the meantime, I think the industry, which is an essential part of the solution of, um, of, um, of, uh, of CO2, uh, we, uh, we will need a clear uh, framework in which companies uh, uh, can work. And I think uh, um, already Javier uh, uh, mentioned it, Michael also, also mentioned it, the, the CBAM uh, is uh, needs to, to bring uh, to, to, to the industry a very clear uh, competitive arena. It is very obvious that uh, Europe is leading uh, the way uh, on, uh, on CO2 reduction, but the problem of CO2 and decarbonization is not only Europe, it's a worldwide uh, issue and we need to make sure that that, that CBAM with uh, free rights addresses and provides a, a, a clear competitive uh, feel for the for the industry. And we are willing to, to, to work with Mr. Timmermans and all his teams, DG Climate, DG Grow, to, to really to really show that uh, that we we can be uh, also part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you're now, you're, I don't know, you're, you're like me, you, you have no plans and you have, you know, you have a computer and you go between Berlin and, 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 and Brussels and, and, and occasionally Kiev. What do you make of all this? I mean, you, you listen to, to, to all these people and, and I was trying to provoke them and to ask them whether they were happy or not. And they think whether the, the sky is falling or, you know, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna be fine. And I'm not getting a straight answer. So what do you think, Jörg? First, thanks a lot for, for inviting me. And I think it's it's great to see that all sectors search for their role in, in decarbonization and often with quite fascinating technologies. And I, I mean, it's a, it's a very different mood than say 10 years ago. And now everybody is on board, everybody's trying to find solutions. And of course, industry is now asking for support. And I mean, we have heard them, them all, all of them have their ideas what would be good for their industry. And in terms of support to, uh, to 
kind of make this decarbonization happier. Uh, essentially, I think there's three types of support that, uh, that industry is asking uh, to different degrees. One is uh, continuation or uh, maybe even increase of free allowances. The second one is carbon border protection measures. And the last one is kind of direct support for, uh, for new technologies. And I personally think it, it should not be an all of the above. I mean, we have in the past had quite uh, uh, quite generous rules for industry. We have seen significant windfall profits for industry from uh, from free allowances, and um, I mean the, the speed at which we uh, we've seen decarbonization in uh, in that phase in industry was not optimal. And um, so so I would argue that for a speedy transition policy. That, that should mainly focus on a, on a robust carbon price and support for industry decarbonization. So kind of on the, uh, on the, on the public support side. So I want to speak about this public support. Um, so what we, uh, what we currently observe is that member, several member states now come up with national support instruments for decarbonizing industry to complement European policies. So you see Germany discussing co uh, contracts for difference. You see uh, in France some discussions. So I think Germany is more advanced. You have the Netherlands that now extended their support schemes also to, uh, to industry. And I'm, I'm sure many other member states do, uh, do the same thing. And those member states do support decarbonization of their national industries for different purposes. One is certainly industrial policy. So be the first to develop new low carbon technologies that you can roll out to, uh, to dominate the world. The second one is, uh, is climate policy it might also play a role. I mean, it's quite interesting that the, that the German contracts for difference are designed by the uh, environment ministry and not the economics ministry, which is uh, interesting. And of course, there's also social regional energy policy aspects. So by supporting certain things, uh, you can, like Germany supporting hydrogen or uh, uh, supporting stuff in certain regions, you can essentially do uh, other policy goals at the same time. Now, all of that is, is good, uh, but there is a risk that richer countries can do much more of this support than, uh, than poorer countries can do. And this might essentially kind of amplify differences in the EU between poorer countries. And this is not a good thing because if you think about it, replacing a fully depreciated steel plant in a poor country might make economically and environmentally much more sense than replacing a relatively new one in a richer country. But the rich country has the money, the poor country does not have, have it. So um, what should we do on a European level? Because you initially asked and kind of what, what is missing in the, in the Fit for 55. No, I don't know what is, will be in the Fit for 55, but I presume something that, uh, that might be strengthened is a European tool to, um, to support industry decarbonization. And this European tool should not prevent member states to move ahead, but it should contain uh, three elements. So first, I would think of a, of a European contracts for different scheme that is funded from common ETS revenues, and it should be competitive. So it should really be competition between all the uh, uh, industry that wants to decarbonize for this money in order to prevent the huge windfalls that we, that we saw in the past. But we might include some brackets that favor less well-off countries. So say, okay, a certain amount of that has to come from, from these countries, for example, to make sure that they are getting access to that. At the same time, I think we, we should kind of strengthen our competition policy rules in a way that allows for some national experimentation with, uh, with, uh, with national tools, but prevents any, any excesses by kind of uh, uh, only, uh, um, say, Germany, for example, does uh, steel sector decarbonization and all the others have to close their, their entire steel industry at some point. And the, uh, and the third one is uh, we should enable such funding for industry transformation in poor countries. Um, and by, by doing that, uh, we might essentially help the negotiations on the, um, on the distribution of initial uh, allocation of allowances. So you have seen uh, last week the, uh, the discussion that was there uh, was essentially about the initial allocation of allowances. And I would argue that if we have a tool like, say, an kind of increased innovation fund that does something like that, that is a bit focused on uh, uh, or quite strongly focused on, on helping industry in, uh, in poorer countries, we might overcome this, uh, this deadlock 
uh, in terms of uh, discussing uh, over initial allocation, which otherwise might end up to be a zero sum game, which uh, politically very rarely solves. So with all that, what, I'm, what I want to say is thinking about kind of an industry decarbonization um, uh, support mechanism based on competitive contracts for difference on a European level, we might find a quite nice way to, uh, to kind of kill a number of birds with, uh, with one stone. Thank you, Andre. Good, we're gonna run out of birds. Now, what I take back from this before passing you to Michael is, I'd like to hear more about technology neutrality, which I think is important. The balance between regulation and markets, markets for low carbon product and what exactly, I know we don't know what's in there, but we kind of notionally know what's in there. Michael. All right, thank you, Andre. Well, fascinating first round to set the scene. Um, we'll have a second round of questions. We encourage uh, the panelists to be um, somewhat shorter so we can go to the Q&A with the audience. I'm sure there's a lot of questions that are waiting to be asked, but in the second round, um, we'll sort of tease out a few of the themes that already were um, brought up in this initial round from each panelist. I'll start uh, with Monsieur Maya. You already mentioned initially that, you know, the power sector is also an industry, but I think one theme that came throughout the remarks was that as decarbonization progresses, power and sort of the traditional industry, manufacturing, et cetera, will be increasingly intertwined. And EDF is of course then going to be very closely working together with many different um, industries and very important for different parts of the value chain. Can you give a bit more of a sense of why, how you see the Fit for 55 package playing a role in that sort of um, um, uh, joint, let's say, effort of power and industry? And I'd encourage you to go out of the comfort zone, not just looking at the opportunities. What are the challenges? Where could this go off the rails, let's say, um, and how could the Fit for 55 package hit or miss exactly on that point? Please, Monsieur mm. Maillard. Well, thank you, Michael, for, for that question, because I think it's often overlooked. Uh, in fact, the, the, the power sector is, is an industry, and we feel uh, really um, uh, involved and, and, and strongly uh, concerned, actually, by that, uh, because of our footprint in, in Europe, uh, we produce uh, roughly 25% uh, uh, of the uh, European low carbon uh, electricity, and also because we invest into a new uh, industrial value chain. And, and I, I think you're right. I think uh, Fit for 55 um, must not be a missed opportunity to support uh, these, these value chains. And, and maybe to answer your question, I will. Uh, uh, be a bit more specific looking at uh, three or two, two or three uh, uh, specific value chain. One, um, let's start with hydro. Uh, hydro has a lot of advantages for the energy uh, mix. Uh, it's not only uh, uh, fantastic uh, decarbonized uh, energy, it's uh, also a storage uh, technology and, and, and it helps the, I mean, it's, it's great for the stability of, of the grid, but it has a lot of industrial uh, advantages as well. Uh, one, it is a mature technology, and uh, that's extremely important if you want to invest into storage in the near future. Uh, having a mature technology is much better than uh, investing into uh, riskier uh, technologies. It creates jobs, local jobs, including in remote areas, you know, in the remote mountains, for example. That's also important. And again, I don't think we'll have public support, support of the citizens and the workers if you don't create jobs through the uh, Fit for 55 or other medians. Um, it, it is also, and, and that's also, I think, important, it is not using any uh, rare raw material. So the problem is, when you look at the legislation, uh, there is clearly a discrimination against hydro. We fully understand that, that there's a lot of environmental challenges going with hydro. But we, if you look only at the storage issue in the, uh, uh, in the, um, uh, in the 10 e regulation that will uh, be uh, revised in the uh, upcoming uh, weeks and months, uh, there is no level playing field between this mature technology, the pump hydro storage, for example, and other storage technologies. It's, it's a missed, clearly a missed opportunity for investment, for the grid, for decarbonization, and for the job content of the Fit for 55. Second uh, aspect uh, to your question, um, nuclear. I think it's, it's, 
it's uh, an elephant uh, in the room, especially an elephant because there's a lot of jobs attached to this industry. You know, it's more than 350 direct in, uh, employees working for, for nuclear. It's up to the member states to decide if they want to do uh, uh, nuclear or not. The problem is, is when it's uh, difficult, not only difficult, but it's going more and more complicated to invest and to create jobs and value into this industrial value chain. And here, obviously, taxonomy, uh, it's not part of, per se, I mean, it's not directly part of the Fit for 55 package, but as you know, and now that we, we got uh, a scientific report uh, clearing the way for the uh, uh, impact on the uh, environment, uh, there is no doubt that nuclear is contributing to mitigating the cl uh, climate change. So we expect a, a, a second uh, 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 delegated act and, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll come back to, a, to a, a, a CO2 emission compass in a way. Uh, we don't need a taxonomy saying we need more renewables. We all know we need renewables to do uh, decarbonization. So we, we need a more refined, not a binary taxonomy, a more refined. Um, I, I have no time to go to the, to the third aspect. It's clear that uh, renewables is a, a strategic industrial value chain. We need not to protect this industry, but to support, to support this industry by uh, facilitating the rolling out of more renewables, especially, for example, on the offshore. There we need long-term planification. It's not only in the Fit for 55, but uh, it's clearly also in the Fit for 55 to facilitate the permitting and the long-term planification of renewables, especially uh, offshore. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Mayer. Going to Judy, um, and again, also we're keeping the second round a bit briefer. I think Andre is suggesting one to two minutes, but um, you know, there's been some polemics, let's say, in, in, in the media debate. Um, is this going to be decarbonization or deindustrialization of Europe? And I think to go back to what Andre said in, in, initially, how will the just transition really feature in this? Is this an afterthought that will be dealt with through the funds and sort of on the cost side? Or is this really already, do you think, going to be an intrinsic part of Fit for 55, also from the policy and the regulation side? Um, I think there's a, a real risk that rhetoric doesn't follow through um, with reality in terms of the, the policy framework. Uh, we can see in the political debate that there's an increasing recognition that actually part of the technical solutions, as we've heard from all of the panelists, many industries have different uh, technical solutions developing. We see the breakthrough research going on in, in the different sectors in which we organize. The social acceptance dimension of this debate is actually the probably the most difficult uh, to, to manage in some ways. It's quite nebulous. It's not an easy fix. It involves a lot of time and resources, and that's difficult to, to to kind of factor into a legislative framework which is focused on technology targets and so on, because we're talking about ensuring that framework of um, of engagement, of dialogue, um, and um, and of participation, and and I think at the moment uh, the rhetoric is starting to move in the right direction, but we're really keen to see that that actually is then implemented through the through the package. And I was really interested in Georg's comments, for example, which sit very closely to the concerns that we've been um, identifying from uh, the trade union movement, that really to ensure that uh, social acceptance, you do need to have a reflection in the uh, Fit to 55 package about how you ensure cohesion in Europe, because it will be those regions who feel left behind and those parts of the workforce that feel left behind where there will be um, a potential lingering um, issue in the future, which, um, you know, will have uh, political consequences. So we have an opportunity now to get it right. I think feeding more uh, earmarking uh, through the ETS into the modernization fund for poorer countries, into uh, the innovation fund, which as an MEP, I was uh, very engaged in the development of the innovation fund in the last revision of the ETS. Uh, there was a lot of skepticism that this was the right way to go, but it, we've been shown that actually it was the right instrument uh, to put in place, and now it needs to be bolstered. They, it was a very uh, conservative 
first earmarking. Let's really start to use ETS revenue to recycle back into decarbonisation rather than letting revenue go into general coffers of national um, treasuries or um, into where we're very concerned that that revenue would go into the repayment of the of the uh, recovery plan debt. We need to see the recycling of revenue back into industries, back into communities uh, that are affected by, um, by this transition. And in that way, we'll start to see rhetoric turning into reality, which is what we want as a trade union movement. Thank you. Over to Andre. Thank you, thank you, Judy. Let's let's try and 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 keep the this this going uh, the dialogue. Uh, Javier, uh, you talked uh, you talked about ammonia and green ammonia. Practically, if you know, again, we don't have a package. We know that, but we pretty much know more or less. We all have around ten associations, think tanks, whatever. That what are the main regulatory and market challenges you're you're facing? What do you think? is going to come out in this package that is going to make the case is going to help you. What do you need to see in this package? Well, um, I mean, um, green ammonia and uh, green ammonia is, is actually a revolution. Eh? OK, we've been in the industry with our gas based ammonia units basically for years uh, fighting to achieve a better energy efficiency. But these, uh, the long hanging fruits are, are already there. So you know, if we want to achieve a real decarbonization, then green ammonia is the solution. We in Fert Iberia, we have taken a, a very courageous uh, position. We have said, OK, we want to have the first industrial scale green ammonia production in less than a year. Eh? And we want to have it. Uh, and of course, Spain is blessed with, with a good uh, renewable uh, energy uh, generation, especially with sun. Eh? And so we have some competitive advantage and we have found a perfect partner in, in Iberdrola. Eh? But it is, we need to understand that this is, we, this is something completely new. This is something, uh, this is a drastic change and this, and we are taking a bet here. Eh? And in, in order to be successful in our view, um, I think the package and everything should include some public support for the ones we, who are early movers in this area. I mean, it is, I mean, we need to, to be very clear. Here you can take, companies can take two strategies. One is a wait and see, and then probably in 10 years, electrolysis will be uh, 10 times the size, will be much more, much bigger, much more efficient. Second, uh, in 10 years time, probably the cost of solar panels will be, will go down by 40%. Efficiency will go up by 25%. So you can just wait until this happens and then jump. Second alternative is to lead the change. But if you lead the change, you need to lead to deal with the learning curve. You need to deal with the inefficiencies of an early technology. And we need to recognize that. Okay, we are introducing the first, the largest electrolyzer that exists in Europe that didn't exist the year before. We are going to use massive amounts of solar energy that probably will be cheaper in 10 years. So we need for this to really develop a, some type of public support for early mover uh, projects so that we start developing these technologies and develop this green hydrogen and green ammonia. Of course, in the long run, the goal would be to have premium markets for certified low carbon products. But in the short run, I think we need public support for early movers so that we kick this, uh, uh, we, we can kick off this, uh, this process and we can help companies who are taking courageous steps to be uh, uh, producing green ammonia at an industrial scale. Mm. So really what we're looking so you will be looking at this package to ensure that there is that 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 support at this less critical level let me go on to 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 michael and look i'm an electrician this is like a dream you have to understand that i came into the business when electricity we were used to six to eight percent growth in demand every year and that you know when i when i came as a young engineer and then it kind of slowed down and and in, you know it, it the world changed and it, the old guys were still talking about six to eight percent i never seen that in you know when i when i was working in, in the electricity industry but now we're back but nevertheless so it's great but indirect seems to be creating a lot of, of problems because you're not getting the indirect compensation is is capped at 75 percent because we're going to have trouble in some way dealing with cbam and indirect cost i don't know how to do that i mean you know, I, I, I don't have a solution for that i'm you know with a whole bunch of smart people we haven't come up so how what what do you make out those indirect costs this is what do you look for in the package for indirect costs 
Well, you're pointing out something very important, uh, what I said before already, that the demand for electricity is likely to grow immensely in the next uh, few years. So uh, I think that we here are kind of spearheading the whole discussion because we as an industry are probably the most electricity dependent already today. Lots of the electrification in the, in the non-ferrous metal industry was done back in the 90s. It happened a long time ago and we are so far down the path and therefore the whole discussion about indirect compensation is extremely important to us, but it will become more and more important to everybody else as the, uh, as the situation evolves and as everybody else gets more uh, electrified. So I think that it's important for everybody. I think that the question of indirect uh, is a very tricky one. It needs to have lots of details around it. Uh, the, uh, the amount of compensation today, somebody will feel it's not enough. Somebody will say it's too much. I heard before somebody saying that it was overcompensated. I don't think that it's been overcompensated at all. We need to stick to what we have as a starter, but yes, you can probably deal with this also in other ways but then you need to include the uh, scope two effects on the imports. And of course that will become very tricky. That is not going to be that easy, but in, in some way you have to do that. And I think we heard a discussion before that you also need to take into downstream products in order to, to make sure this works. And it's gonna be a tricky, administratively tricky situation, but it's clearly doable. So um, I will really keep my, my answer short. Uh, but I will answer one question that's very quick that comes through the chat here that I saw. The question is, are the consumers willing to pay for low carbon uh, products? And I'll just quickly answer that. There are two things around it. Number one, the consumer needs to understand that if I buy something low carbon, is it really low carbon? Do I have trust in the certification? Or is this just somebody greenwashing something and I'm just paying more for something that's equally bad as everybody else? That needs to be to be fixed and it needs to be certified in a certain way. The second one is that consumer can sometimes be forced to pay for it through standardization. I think that's another way that needs to come into different standards that I really do apply. With that, I keep my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I still remember live better electrically. I'm, I'm sure I'm not sure that was just a North American thing or that was a, a worldwide thing, but I remember that. Michael. Thank you. Simone, over to you. You said something which I think probably created some um, frowns in, in the panel when you, when you um, asserted that there had been no evidence of leakage in the past. And I've seen the research and I think it's a bit heterogeneous. You know, a lot of the retrospective analysis, of course, looks at the situation under EUA prices of five euros, not terribly much more, um, and handsome free allocation. Do you think that is changing? I mean, we're seeing a change in context. EUA prices, of course, going up, free allocation may decline. And the second thing, um, the Alliance of Energy Intensive Industries a few weeks ago wrote a paper, issued a paper suggesting that because the power sector has this much bigger decarbonization potential at lower cost, there should maybe be a rebalancing of the share of free allocation or sort of this cutoff point where the cross sectoral correction factor would, would kick in to the expense, let's say, of the power sector. Do you think such a rebalancing would be just, merited, um, um, justified? Simone. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Also, because I believe it's, I was a bit tough on the first round, so I tried to be smooth in the second one. I'm not saying that, uh, that I'm, I'm saying that it is very good. I, 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 you are right about there are different reports, maybe than the, here and there, there is a, you know, some, it depends on the kind of policies the countries put in place. But on average, my, according to the numbers I have, the evidence is that in aggregate, basically, there wasn't a big problem. Oh, in, some, in some phase, for sure, the longer allocation of free. Uh, credits was a good, a good, and it was a positive. And I don't know, I mean, we are very happy to have a, a robust energy intensity in the industry in Europe. It's not to say, but of course, as, as I say, it doesn't mean that there is not a problem. There is a problem indeed. It is clear that if we, if we ask, I don't know, steel makers again, or metal producers to pay 50 euros of CO2 costs, uh, it, it will be a problem. Uh, many, many, many industries around Europe are protected by specific uh, tools. So this is what I'm saying. It's not, it's not that there is not, it, it should not be a problem. But, but the, the, my point is that the tools that overall European Union put in place or allowed countries to put in place, such as, for example, you know, Germany or Italy schemes that are neutralized at the cost of some part of tariffs for energy intensive, worked pretty well. Then this is to say that it's a problem. We have to tackle the problem, but it, it has to be, it may be tackled in the future as it was in the past, of course, with a different pace, because if a 
carbon price goes up over 50 euros, the problem is, 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 is different. And the effectiveness is, is, is more evident. You know, uh, it, it's, it's clear that it's not, I think, enough emphasize the fact that the most important uh, uh, transformation probably in the fossil fuels utilization in the world is going to happen in a few years in Europe with the shutting down of coal plants, which is basically a less, let's say, penniable issue because of, you know, of the progressive increase of cost of carbon, which creates you know, the progressive awareness that this technology, once you put the right price to the externality, is pushed out of the competitiveness which is a, a, a quite healthy way to promote decarbonization, I think, because in this case, market works. It's not working for everything. I mean, ETS is not working for, for example, clearly, for promote, or it's working very marginally for promoting, for example, I don't know, uh, renewable investment, for example. It's not a key issue when you decide if you want to put your money or not in a renewable investment. But this is, this is working pretty well. So just to say that energy intensive sector did a lot, because if you look at, at the numbers, clearly the, the best performer, let's say, in terms of decarbonization historically has been the power sector. Just we got the, the technology, it, 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 as some commenters say it properly, there were quite a lot of money, money pushing that. So it was a, a good money put in order to push an available technology to work very well. Industry did very well. I do not believe actually that we should change the balance between power sector and other sector inside the ETS sector, because actually I think the ETS worked pretty well. I mean, my, my general evaluation is that now ETS is delivering. I mean, is there any decarbonization? Is delivering the coal phasing out? Is not, is, has not killed our industry, which means it worked pretty well. What we have to do is we're balancing the efforts between ETS and the non ETS sectors, which Unfortunately, up to date, performed much less. I'm not saying that we should enlarge the perimeter of ETS. I do not believe that you know pushing ETS, for example, in a, in a, in a, you know private transport or, or buildings is an easy job. Probably is much better to work to standards to you know. But it's clear that the effort has to be rebalanced outside the ETS sector because the ETS sector has to do a lot. We have to do a lot as a power sector. All our, uh, you know, industries may do a lot, but non-ETS sector did not, uh, not so much, and there is a lot of way to be, to be, to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simone. Something you mentioned just now is that, you know, the ETS and, and the prices have only been able to trigger certain decarbonization options, especially in the power sector. Going to the cement sector, Isidoro, you have a very high share of process emissions. Dealing with those will require a higher carbon price than what we yes. see even now in the market. I think um, that's sort of generally accepted. Um, what triggers, what levers do you see can be used in the short term sort of for quick gains in the cement sector? And what are the implications for cost, including of cement as a product? What does that mean for the competitiveness of the sector? Let me add, let me add one more question if yes. I can to that. Would you prefer a regulation or a high, a high carbon price on ETF? I mean, um, in reality, and Simon uh, mentioned it, is market dynamics uh, who really drive uh, the movements of, uh, of companies like us. Uh, it is very obvious that these markets dynamics are in many cases driven by, by legislation. I mean, uh, how many markets of CO2 do exist uh, in the world, few of those, and, and one of these is in, in Europe, but this, uh, this market of, of CO2 uh, has driven the, the, the behavior of the, of the cement industry. Andre, you were mentioning at the beginning of this panel, this one-to-one, -one, and I corrected you, is one, uh, one to point eight is uh, eventually we're going down to, to one uh, to, to point six. And even uh, my group, Lafarge Holcim, has stated very clear that in 2030, it will be less than one to point five. Eh? So, so, so really, there, there is a market 
dynamic that in many cases is, is driven by this uh, this uh, this price right and and to to to, to reply to your question uh, michael what are the the, the things that the cement uh, industry is doing for sure uh, increasing energy efficiency etc but i mentioned uh, in my previous uh, uh, intervention that the the the, the most uh, important focus that the cement industry has is circular i mean uh, circular uh, circular energy in, in particular is a way in which uh, the cement industry is working uh, uh, a lot uh, thanks to this uh, we have already reduced 18 percent co2 emissions compared to 1990 kyoto and working with uh, with alternative fuels by replacing fossil fuels uh, today the the cement industry in europe is saving close to 22 percent uh, 22 million tons sorry of um, of co2 emissions at uh, at eu level because we have already replaced 48% uh, of fossil fuels with uh, with alternative fuels that can be urban waste, uh, uh, industrial waste. And, and we want to go beyond that. We want to reach uh, 60% uh, in 2030 and 90% in 2050 and, and half of that uh, being uh, biomass so we want the, the the cement industry to really be part of the effort of uh, of european society towards uh, reduction of uh, of co2 emissions so and as i mentioned to you is this market dynamics created by by the co2 uh, prices that is not only working on the on the industrial side but also trying to push uh, an offer to uh, to customers you see uh, here on uh, on my side of my screen this eco pact. I mean uh, we have launched uh, a low carbon uh, concrete for for our customers, and I have seen many questions from from panelists uh, from people uh, listening to to us. Is there a market for this? And this is the key challenge. I mean, how do we drive the public opinion towards? the consumption of this uh, low carbon uh, product because at the very end we are an industry we are driven to to consumers and, and to their requests so really all us uh, europeans need to be driven towards the the, the, the consumption of uh, these uh, low co2 products otherwise What's the point uh, in producing a low CO2 carbon or an electric car if there is not a consumption of it? So we, we really need to think about the behavior of the industry that we are doing and also the behavior of the so European society. And this is what I, the question that I have is, do we see anything in this package that would drive that consumer uh, behavior in, in a significant way? I have two hands up. Uh, right now. So if you folks want to have questions, please raise your little electronic hand up. Before I go, however, to Jörg Zachman, as you know, Jörg, again, you, uh, you close the loop here, as my boss used to say, and you have the opportunity to reflect to some of the stuff that you heard. But is this, is this real pack, this package is going to have a significant impact of the industrial landscape in Europe? when this legislation is in, implemented. I mean, it's gonna take a couple of years, but eventually you're gonna get there, uh, you know, by hook or by crook. So is this gonna alter the industrial, is there gonna be an industrial Europe at the end of this? That's a, um, I mean, it's a complex question because we, we don't know. You have two minutes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, no, but it, I would argue that um, it will still policy and technology where this will drive us so just to give an example i mean in steel production we, we might steel production to end up in some hydrogen valleys close to to north sea landing points for hydrogen if that's the technology that we that we support and uh, and uh, or that the richest countries support and uh, that uh, that is then going to dominate. Or we might have high, uh, essentially steel production in regions in the south where electricity is cheap because of a lot of, uh, of solar being there. Or we might have uh, um, steel production in regions that have access to carbon, uh, yeah, carbon storage space, more like close to the North Sea again. So I think the global uh, or the European distribution of industry might 
quite significant uh, change with the uh, with the development of the energy sector that we see in the uh, in the next one or two decades and policy is going to be, uh, play a big role we still have this discussion on the role of hydrogen the role maybe of different forms of uh, of greener or less green methane and uh, the the role of electricity and uh, also where this is going to come from so whether some of this energy is going to be imported and where essentially the landing points will be or whether at the end of the day uh, people see that maybe steel production uh, close to where the sun is namely in, in Africa or in Saudi Arabia, makes much more sense than, uh, than shipping around hydrogen across the uh, Harvey world and, uh, and then producing steel at, uh, at three to, uh, to 10 times higher energy cost here in Europe. So I think there are still, so the future is not yet written on that and the, uh, and the regional distributional effects that, uh, that this might have can be, can be quite significant. The question now is, what are we uh, going to do about it? So are we trying to, uh, to kind of uh, fight against that with protective measures that kind of keep the existing industry as long as possible to, to see it then all of a sudden completely vanished um, or by giving free allowances or overly protective carbon border measures? Or do we try to, to kind of ride the wave and, and find solutions that are good for us and, and start to support the stuff that we think is, uh, is good for our industry? And of course, I would argue for the second. So uh, the, my thinking would be, yes, Europe is only 10% of the emissions. So uh, what can Europe's role be? Well, I don't think we should kind of wait and see, but we should go ahead and say, okay, we are providing the technology for the, for the world. We are showing the, uh, showing the way and we are saying where this uh, stuff is going to be located. And at the same time, we might think about an export strategy about green technologies uh, that is much more aggressive than, than what we currently have, uh, like the Chinese pushing for, for coal plants in, uh, in other parts of the world. We could push much more for, uh, for low carbon technology in other parts of the world, and that would uh, kind of that would really generate jobs for the, for the next generation and not just kind of protect the, the jobs from the, from the last generation. So with that, I uh, stop here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, look, I uh, I had have a couple of people, and I, I let uh, already I uh, John Cooper from Fuels Europe uh, to uh, into the uh, uh, as a, as a panelist. So John, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you okay. hear me? Okay. Yes. Let's try to make this as brief as possible, and then for Pete Harrison, uh, Pete Harrison after this. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead. Thanks, Andre. Go ahead uh, look, I've, yeah. I've got a question. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the role of uh, carbon pricing and whether that's sufficient. Um, but a lot of the problems that come up there is because it's not yet international. And of course, while we are having this dialogue in Europe about how to make uh, extension of ETS uh, and the, the deepening of the, of the targets work, together with the CBAM, we've got international trade negotiations going on. I'm interested in panelists' views on how Europe uses the, the CBAM idea to progress uh, the pressure for carbon pricing schemes in other parts of the world, in particular our major trade partners. Thanks. Thank you, John. And I think that as, a, as a somebody who is going to attend UNSC's negotiations in uh, starting Monday, uh, it, you know, I wonder how a G77 negotiator will react to that. Uh, Pete Harrison. Yeah, thanks, Andre. Um, so I, I guess my question is, is primarily kind of directed at Jude, but I think it's probably a relevant question to, to everyone on the panel. And it's, um, it's about planning for just transition. I mean, as uh, George just said, you know, like, you know, the, you know, we could decarbonize industry through, you know, um, hydrogen, you know, coming from the south, we could have, you know, clusters around CCS close to the North Sea, uh, you know, there's many different variations. Another one you could add is, you know, circularity could play a, a, a huge role in terms of reducing uh, demand for primary material. So there's, there's multiple pathways to zero carbon uh, heavy industry. And I wonder what does that mean in terms of uh, planning for just transition? Because you know, you know, it, it, it becomes quite difficult then to identify both geographically and temporarily where the impacts are going to happen. Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, the same is true, of course, with energy decarbonization. You know, to some extent, we know that we're, you know, we're moving away from coal now. We don't really understand where the non-economic barriers are going to occur, nor do we understand whether we're going to go leap straight to renewables or perhaps actually incrementally we're going to drop into a world of gas, right? And so, that, so you know, my, my thinking is about, you know, how does that compare with uh, a, pro, a, a process that is driven via norms and standards, right? If you say we're banning combustion engines in 2030, you pretty much know what you're going to get. You can plan for that temporarily and geo... Uh, and, and geo Let's keep it short. Please. Yeah. So uh, essentially, you know, just to reflect on the difficulties or the differences for just transition planning between a market-based mechanisms approach versus a approach based on norms and standards. Thank you. Yeah, Pete, you are from, just introduce yourself because I don't uh, show everybody. From, I, the I, we all, yeah. from the European Climate uh, Foundation. Thank you, Peter. Uh, guys, okay, anybody wants to pick up on these two questions? Uh, who, you know, this is a rapid fire discussion. Simone, you wanna start? Yes, yes, very, very quick answer. Well, on the global carbon price is a very, is a, again, I will try to be again a provocative. I think we, we all have to thank Donald Trump because without, without his presidency, probably Europe would never uh, took, it, took into consideration the idea of introducing some kind of example of border carbon adjustment of this kind of stuff. And maybe I, I'm exaggerating, I'm overshooting a little bit, but it's not, I, I, I don't believe it to be so very far from reality. And I believe that this is, this is a process that will come. I'm pretty much optimistic on that, step by step. This is not, you know, overnight. So, but uh, it, it's clear that giving to everybody the impression that we are ready to raise some barrier in order to prevent carbon, uh, uh, border carbon leakage, I would say carbon dumping, uh, it will be it will be a clear signal that something has to move. And probably, uh, you know, we already have it. You know, uh, but you are the most, probably the most expert guy in the planet on that. Uh, we have a very good uh, experience coming up at local level in different geographies. Uh, also unexpected geography. So we tend to be optimistic. It's not going to be a, a fast a fast journey, but it, it will come. On the just transition, that's very important. I agree with your point, so that's, that's fundamental. I, I, have, I believe that uh, I'm pretty much confident that Europe is ready to work on the most critical areas. So I believe that tools, money, and policies that Europe has in mind and put in place in order to manage you know, the transition in the, I don't know, in the coal uh, uh, producing regions of Central Eastern Europe uh, will deliver because it's something that is already there in some way. But this is not the key. I mean, we have to take this for, for granted. What, what, what is really relevant? We, 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 took, we carried out several studies, demonstrated that the, the, the overall transition, accelerated transition may bring more jobs. The problem is more on the quality, on the quality on the mix. It's changed a lot of mix. And I think two things are needed. The first one is, again, the right education for our younger, uh, uh, citizens, because today in many countries, including in the, the most advanced countries in terms of education, the system is not very much matching with it, what is needed for the, for the transition. Second, we, ma we need what you, we use it to call political industry, industrial, uh, sorry, poly uh, industrial policies, sorry, for the critical value chains of the energy transition. Because this is a world, this is a real, comp the real competition is. We have to be able to incorporate in our regions, in our continent, the critical value chains leading to the energy transition. What we are doing on battery is important, it's not enough probably. What we want to do on hydrogen and electrolyzer is important, it's not enough, we have to do more. A lot of our research, probably we may ensure step-by-step new generation, high-tech, um, components for renewable generation and, and so on and so forth. That, this is very important. This is where the real issue of just transition is. The ability to uh, have in Europe, to bring in Europe the critical value chains. Judith? 
Yeah. I think uh, John wants to introduce after, uh, intervene after that. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so um, a word on both uh, questions. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you answered before me, Simona, because um, uh, I have to say uh, I don't have the optimism uh, that you have about uh, what Europe actually knows, partly because let's look at actually what Europe knows about this transition. We don't have any employment figures at granular level to be able to identify where the workers are who will be impacted by the just transition in key sectors. In all of the energy intensive industries, in the automotive industry, across the transport sector, we actually don't know where those workers are. If you look in terms of regional level and local level. So how can you organize in a coherent way a just transition when you don't actually know where the people um, geographically are who are right on the front face of the transition. All of the impact assessments stop at a level of analysis which is incredibly abstract compared to the reality on the ground. So we need to have far more granular analysis to be able to have a comprehensive framework on just transition which will allow the accompaniment of, of people and regions through the transition. That's the, that's the first point. The second point is this question of markets or regulation. It's clear, um, uh, Pete, that uh, a regulatory framework allows a more um, managed transition. Um, you can structure employment programs, regional development programs along the frame of the regulation. Market um, mechanisms always add a level of, of uncertainty into the mix, but that's not saying that a, a good combination of both isn't the way to work forward. The problem for us is when all of the emphasis is on the ETS and on the carbon price signal without the regulatory framework um, supporting as well. And it's actually the combination, and that's when we talk about a strong industrial policy uh, pr uh, strategy alongside uh, the ETS, that's what we're talking about. The structures to create markets for new products, the role of standardization, the role of public procurement, as a lever um, for change, as well as um, actual stand emission standards in different sectors. And for example, for road transport, it was said um, earlier, I think also by Simona, uh, that uh, the extension of the ETS to a sector like road transport, in our view, is a, a, real, um, a real wrong step um, from the EU level, far better to use standards and, and other mechanisms, regulatory mechanisms, rather than rather than market um, mechanisms. Um, so for planning, this is a colossal change across Europe. I think sometimes people underestimate the scale of the social transition that we're talking about and the impact in terms of employment and the impact um, of, yes, today's workforce. Um, but if we lose, for example, vocational education facilities, if we lose all of the, the industrial fabric around different sectors, that then has a direct knock-on impact on future um, employment and the opportunity to pull back and to, to be able to um, master some of the opportunities for future. And we're seeing from things like the Battery Alliance that actually skills and skills shortages and the skills infrastructure and that social uh, dimension is seen as a key bottleneck for the development of the industry in Europe. So let's not underestimate um, the, the scale of the challenge. Just a word on CBAM really, really quickly. I think what's very interesting in the last few months is the level of climate diplomacy, which has been sparked as a result of the proposal. The, the assertion from Europe that we are moving forward regardless of opposition elsewhere. And I think that opens up um, some um, new discussions at international level with key trading partners actually to leverage up climate ambition elsewhere in the world. So when, when Europe shows that it's serious and that it's not backing down under pressure from trading partners, actually, I think we're able to play our role at a global level in leveraging action elsewhere. And, um, and we, we are strong advocates of CBAM, but if the knock on the spillover effect is also increasing uh, climate ambition elsewhere in the world, then that's a great thing. Folks, let's keep this brief, please. Otherwise, we don't, we're not gonna have a rapid fire. Uh, John and then Eric, and then I'll pass it on to to uh, to Michael. Michael, you take yeah, over. Th thanks, Andre. Uh, well, I wasn't going to say anything about uh, ETS for transport, but uh, Judith, you've just uh, you've just raised it. 
we would agree that we need great caution there. Um, you know, as an industry, we collect 270 billion of taxes as we as we sell fuels across the uh, the, the EU, and um, ETS for transport has the potential to put 30 cents, 20, 30 cents on a liter of fuel, which, from experience, could well be a route to bring out the gilet jaune again. I think uh, another way to think about this should be to look at the way fuel tax works. Fuel tax itself could become a carbon taxation system. And really, our view is that you need sticks but carrots as well in, 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 in the whole thing. So if your fuel price goes up for the petroleum portion, what way out do people have? Can they then choose to have a renewable fuel? If your only way is to buy an electric car, that could well leave people behind. Of course, one day they will be cheaper. Um, but carbon pricing for fuels can actually spur the development of renewables there. But my main purpose actually was to actually uh, answer, Pete, your question about uh, a sort of more of a command and control regulation or carbon pricing. I think, I think you need both, actually. I really think you need both. Uh, the ideal end state is a strong carbon price universally applied. But when you look at the international aspects, the transitional aspects, the long-term strategic aspects, you've got to have other stronger signals as well. And I do think we're missing the boat on a number of different things. And if, if I can take a minute to give you, you know, a brief description of something in my personal life, trying to build a house extension at the moment needs cement, it needs steel, it needs deliveries of things, and it needs planning permission. Um, the, the planning permission has got a strong environmental component now. I am in the UK at the moment, a country with a 78% target for reductions for 2030. The environmental constraint is I have to protect the tree five meters away. That's all. I don't have to use low carbon cement. I don't have to use uh, low carbon steel. Um, protect, protecting the tree will cost an extra 20% on the project. Having low carbon cement and steel, I reckon would put 2% on the cost of the project. Planning permission or other restrictions outside of carbon pricing could also help create an incentive and a visibility to customers for low carbon products. And our experience actually looking at how the development of electric cars is working, there are many other ways to nudge consumers towards that option. Use of a bus lane, free parking, et cetera. Number of different things. So it's both. And let's be creative about how we nudge the customers into the better choices. Yeah. Let me nudge the next speaker. Uh, Michael, you take over. I think um, Erki still had his hand yeah, raised. Thank you. Very, yeah. very briefly, Andre and, and Michael, thank you. No, I, first, I wanted to, uh, the first one will be extremely brief because uh, I wanted to say what Judith uh, uh, just said. I, if the EU is consistent, the CBAM can be a powerful tool also to, to steer other countries into the right direction. And, and uh, it's no use to be a trailblazer if you don't have. Uh, you know, on, on the uh, um, uh, decarbonization, if you do not, uh, I mean, you cannot only lead by example. Uh, it's extremely important to, uh, to, to start uh, this new process and hopefully this, this will lead to positive results at the COP26. But anyway, no, the, 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 the concrete point I wanted to make is regarding just transition is, is also that you uh, vocational training to retrain actual workers outside the energy sector is extremely important. Look at, for example, at the aeronautics sector today. They are going through a massive crisis and it's, I won't say it's an opportunity, uh, it, it, it would be uh, uh, it would not be appropriate to say so, but clearly you have uh, highly skilled workers there, and they can be retrained, and and you need some sort of support and planning on these uh, to 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 do that. And and the last point, really quick, uh, on the extension of the ETS, I, I understand, I share this idea that it's it probably uh, you you can't reach uh, the appropriate level of CO two pricing to change. The, the behavior when you look at uh, road transport, for example, or buildings, but we need all type of CO2 signals for all type of components. So starting to investigate and, and maybe to, as the commission is, is planning to look at how to slowly uh, develop also a CO2 component for uh, um, uh, fuel delivery uh, can be a right direction. If you don't uh, let go the uh, uh, what is clearly working right now, which is the regulation. So it's it's I think uh, uh, it was uh, the previous speaker said that you need both. Uh, you need even more than both. You need also some some action on taxation again to have the the 
proper hierarchy between what is uh, with a heavy uh, CO2 content and with what is without a CO2 content. Thank you. Merci. Isidoro, muy breve, por favor. Yes, no, I mean, I think uh, I raised the point several times and I'm very happy about the, the speech of, of John. I mean, we're we are focused on, on the European Commission, the Fit for 55 pack, the industry behavior. And, and at few points, we have spoken about the customers. All of us, I mean, there are 221 panelists I see uh, today. I mean, we need to change our habit. I'm, 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 it was good to hear to John that he needs to protect the tree. I hope he, he also used uh, this uh, low carbon uh, cement, low carbon concrete, that he built a house with a high uh, level of uh, thermal uh, efficiency because the future is there. And I think I want to make a pledge that uh, I think uh, through this panel, we have demonstrated that the industry is willing to commit, is willing to change, is willing to reduce uh, the CO2 footprint, but also make a pledge that we all European customers realize that we have a role uh, to play by consuming these low CO2 products. Thank you. Among the attendees, two hands were raised. I'll start with uh, Robert Jan Jäger of ArcelorMittal. Thanks very much. Welcome, Robert. Can you hear me like this, Rob? Yes, 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 we can hear thanks. you. Uh, yes, I would like to raise also the issue what Judith mentioned that we are talking about concepts here. Uh, while the policy is now going very far in, in, in extra policy proposals and it's coming quick and they need to be based on, on the industry and commercial reality and that we have not seen. So we know a little bit more about the policy concepts but we don't know what is the extra impact on commercial things, on, on the workers, as you just said, well, also the industry. Uh, but what you see is what is not being discussed today is the what we really need is financial resources for the carbon decarbonization. And that I've not heard. And I think maybe that's, you can also have another session on that uh, because this not it is not there, it wasn't there. And now with the new European debt union, it's a big problem. And what is behind all this policy, what you see, is exactly this issue. Why is transport being proposed as ETS? Not because it's efficient, only to raise money. Why is there full auctioning proposals for industry? Not because it's, really, it's good against carbon leakage, because it will create carbon leakage to raise money. So maybe we should, Mike, we can have another session to talk about this, because this is about all the things behind the policy. Um, so what we see is that. Um, yeah, uh, if you have a, uh, the, the, uh, Michael, you have made all these discussions on the CBAM. What we see is with this CBAM, which is discussed now, you can have an also another one, uh, at the sacrifice of, is abused as a sacrifice of free location, the combination leads to carbon leakage. It's not protecting more. We need more protection of carbon leakage for the extra high carbon price. This combination, lower free location with a weak CBAM, is leading, is creating carbon leakage. This is actually what we want to oppose. So the design has to be really different to stop carbon leakage. Then with a higher target, we need higher protection, not lower protection. So the issue is, can we discuss, or what do you, how do you see the, how do we, can we create actual, the financial means for industry to decarbonize? One, which includes not to milk it right away now to, uh, give up uh, to create these competitiveness problems. Is that what you have at the short term competitiveness problems, which will milk the, the financial resources to stop um, the decarbonization investments, which we need to do now. So this is behind everything we need to do. And how would you suggest we do this? No, not surprisingly, a very, very tricky question. Thank you, Robert Jan. Let me also right away ask Andreas Bodemer um, to bring in his question so that the panelists can think about a response to this very difficult question from Robert Jan. And Andreas, please briefly introduce yourself. I'm not sure that everybody knows you in the, in the panel. Hello, um, I am Andreas Bodema, uh, working with the EU liaison office in Brussels. And as a trade union, we represent around uh, 2.3 million workers in different sectors, such as the automotive industry, steel, etc. So we have some real world experience with 
transition. And I can tell you, we are in the middle of a transition. It is not as we are seeing a transition uh, at the horizon. So um, it is currently driven by decarbonization, but also uh, uh, by globalization, digitization. And what unfortunately, what we see is that too many companies do not have any strategies on uh, how to deal with this transition. So with all the talk about regulators and what, uh, what politics have to do and what institutions have to do, we must not forget the um, companies and hold them responsible for uh, developing just transition pathways. So that would be my, my, my adding probably to, to the discussion and uh, to have it to keep the uh, keep business uh, in, in mind. Thank you, Andreas. Um, Andre, I, I think, you know, we could just ask for responses or we could also really already have kind of a closing round. These were two very forward looking and broad questions. And I think each panelist will have some thoughts. What do you think? I think that we should, I think considering the fact we have another 10 minutes, I think we should take a, a final round and, and give uh, people the opportunity to react to the questions as well as, as make their final uh, closing remarks. Should so we start see, in, yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to suggest, let's start maybe in reverse order. We twice had the round starting with Erti, ending with Georg. How about we start with Georg this time? Sorry to put you on the spot, Georg, but I know you're quick on your feet. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, maybe a, a thought on. Um, I mean, we had a broad, uh, broad discussion now, and I think uh, maybe a thought on the distributional consequences again that uh, that have popped up on uh, on various occasions, and I think they are crucial for also kind of getting decarbonis uh, getting kind of buy-in of voters into, uh, into decarbonization policies. And um, we have had the question by Pete, for example, about the, the role of, um, uh, of standards and regulatory tools. And my take here is, I mean, we, we should not underestimate the distributional effects of, uh, of non-carbon pricing measures. Um, we have, um, for example, having discussions on Poland and the, and the role that coal plays still in the heating sector in Poland. And um, okay, if you have a high carbon price, people are going to, uh, uh, poor people that still have coal heating are going to pay very dearly. But if we introduce regulation to, uh, to stop them from using them, uh, their, their coal heating, they have to completely stop, uh, stop heating. So I, we have to be very careful not to, uh, to shoot the idea of uh, um, um, kind of, uh, of, of carbon pricing as an efficient tool with the argument of, uh, of distributional effects, while other tools might be much more regressive. And here again, I would argue that, uh, that there are support instruments that are available that can be made in a, uh, in a, in a, in a competitive way, also available for, for poorer households to help them to, uh, to benefit from decarbonization and maybe potentially leapfrog modernization of their household appliances uh, or their cars in a way that is good for our economy. And uh, Bruegel will come up in the, in, the, in the next week with a paper on, on contracts for difference that might even uh, also look on the, uh, on the household appliance side. So um, yeah, stay, stay put for that. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me. Thank you, Georg. And to Isidoro, responses to the two questions by Robert, Jan, Andreas, and also any other closing thoughts from your side? No, no, it's, it's, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, the panel has been uh, uh, very, very, very interesting. I, I think I have uh, the, the questions uh, are very relevant and I have, think I have demonstrated through my, not only my speech, but also the fact uh, that uh, correcting to, to Andre that it is no longer one-to-one, -one, but but uh, one to, to, to 0.7 and even 2.5 uh, in the future, the industry is, is really working. We have developed one year ago uh, our uh, zero uh, carbon uh, roadmap. We are very much working with uh, the European Union. I think uh, ETS uh, mechanism has produced uh, results and will continue to, to produce uh, results. The industry requires this uh, uh, free, uh, free trade, uh, free, free rights to, to continue uh, the evolution towards uh, 2030 and, uh, and beyond. So we, we we are really wo willing to work 
with the with Franz Timmerman and, and, and his team on the definition of um, of CBAM and and to to say the least uh, once again eh, uh, Europe has selected a, a, an economic uh, way of working we really need to make sure that uh, we Europeans we uh, we we start thinking about uh, low carbon uh, solutions low carbon product and like John we not only uh, care about the trees in our garden but we also do care about the energy consumption in our houses that there is enough ventilation and, and low energy consumption I can tell you that uh, you you can achieve that with uh, cement and concrete products thank you Well, Isidoro, I, I can tell you one thing. I will remember that it is not one to one. That's one to point eight or point five. That I, you know, I will not make that mistake again. No, uh, I mean it's just part of the learning, Andrea. <laughs> Every day we learn something. Okay. Uh, Simone, you had your hand up, but we just want. Yeah, to no, no, it's okay. 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 I, I, no, I, I... Uh, I, I really like the spirit of, 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 Isidore, of Isidore comment because you know we, we, you know in the, the, this kind of debate uh, that, that's very European. No? We are discussing a lot on how much things may go wrong, you know? and without, without much reference to what is what has been working up to date and what may work. And I, I'm pretty much sure that this will may work. Of course, everything has, has to be improved. And in this spirit, you know, I, that, that's a more suggestion for you, Andre, because we should focus on what what is working, what worked. You know? Going back to what Andreas was saying, and also in some case, Judith. I mean, we have plenty of evidence that you may go to just transition in the proper way. I mean, if you were, if you, if you want, I may bring experience of our company. I mean, we're shutting down tens and tens of coal plants around the world, not only in Europe, not only in Italy or in. Uh, or in Spain, also in Chile, we're getting you know coal plant in Russia without losing one job, with a, without without losing the site. I mean, very often by proposing you know circularity in the utilization of the site, uh, with killing the people, utilizing the people in other in other ventures, putting a putting a you know uh, a, a, a renewable park uh, or a, 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 or selling it to a to a water park. In some case, I mean, things may be done. And there are plenty of experiences that this is a direction that may work. And it's indeed working. So focusing a little more on what has been working, what may work, what is working, what may be replicated, instead of, of discussing a lot about what should go wrong, because, you know, of course, things are complicated. But I believe that there is, again, plenty of evidence that the right is a good one. We have the technology, we have the finance, we have the companies. Of course, but we don't have to make mistakes and we have to work out on the priorities. Priority number one is uh, incorporating the European vision, the value, the full value chain of decarbonization processes, which is, you know, easier to say than to do, but this is, again, we may be concrete on that. We may be practical. There are examples. Thank you very much, Andre, for organizing that. Very, always positive, Simone. Uh, Mika. Thank you. I will quickly just reflect on one or two of the things that have been brought up here and the questions and just finalize my remarks. Circle economy has been brought up many times. We haven't really spoken so much about it. From the metal point of view, we are, of course, extremely positive on the circular economy. That's the basis of why non-ferrous metals are so well and so possible to use. However, having said that, when you look at the total balance, it is not going to solve the problem of the enormous need for, for uh, non-ferrous metals in this transition. I think that's a question that we haven't really spoken anything about during this one, and also how to make sure that we don't get to see the extreme carbon leakage that we've seen already in the non-ferrous sector, especially in nickel and in, in aluminum, uh, to go forward. So that's a little bit. I would then also just uh, reiterate that we, from our side, of course, also extremely grateful to be working together to make sure that whatever new regulation that comes in crazy what we have will be just, will be fair, and will achieve the targets and will not shoot behind it, behind or beside the target, which is uh, always a risk. And as I said, regarding CBA and so on, the devil is in the detail. We need to make sure that it's done right, that it's not done wrong. And we have to think about things like, uh, how do we handle export? How do we handle the uh, competitiveness outside Europe? And finally, I do believe that Europe can export the carbon cost to other parts of the world. It might take a while, but I think that that's possible. Thank you all.
Micah, you. Judith, your final comments. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation um, to be to be here as well. I guess um, directly linking on to what um, Mikkel's just said, for us, um, it's that's why the co-design of these uh, sectoral pathways is so important because in that way we can put together the uh, climate uh, policy, the um, circular economy dimension, raw materials policies, uh, the social dimension in a holistic and obviously the energy question in a in a holistic way, which allows the the specificities of the different sectors uh, to be addressed in a more granular and and practical uh, way. And I think um, Andreas uh, added actually a really important element that, yes, we may have a handful of really good examples um, and some okay examples, um, but we have many um, places where that conversation isn't happening in dialogue with the workforce. And using uh, the structures of industrial relations, European works councils, um, and, and different forum of dialogue are actually really important to ensure that social acceptance in terms of uh, the transition in companies. But my last comment, I just wanted to answer Robert's question because uh, this for us is really fundamental. Um, the resources which are, um, or the revenue which is accrued through these different market mechanisms, whether it's the ETS or the CBAM, should, in our view, be recycled back into the transition in a clear way and should be supporting uh, the decarbonization of our societies and economies. And in avoiding the situation where we end up with uh, these policies being cash cows for the repayment of European debt is absolutely vital uh, because that will undermine us um, in the long term. And, and some of our concrete ideas, because you asked, how do we do it? Our concrete ideas are let's increase the earmarking within uh, ETS revenues for those key three key funds in our view, the Modernization Fund, the Innovation Fund, and uh, the Just Transition Fund, so that we can see where those monies go. And then we can do some of the points that Georg mentioned about ensuring that we address the distributional differences between regions and countries, ensuring that um, not all of the money goes to those who already have um, quite a lot in their local wallets. But actually, there is a sense of, of solidarity and justice spread through the, the financial instruments as well. Thanks. Many thanks, Judith. And Javier. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Just as, as final remarks, uh, well, first of all, um, to say clearly that the fertilizer sector is clearly committed to this decarbonization. And, and clearly, my company, Fertiberia, who is already investing in green ammonia to have green ammonia production at an industrial scale, is a clear example. Eh? But we understand that a higher level of climate ambition should be uh, together with a higher level of climate uh, leakage protection eh, in order to manage this transition. And for that, we believe that CBAM ETS and how we structure all of these regulations is going to be key. We need to achieve clearly a level playing field. Eh? And for that, we, it is very important to have a clear dialogue uh, between sectors so that uh, actually regulators understand very well how sector, how the market behave and the products that are involved and that there is no uh, any missing missing piece. Of course, uh, we raise in this panel also the financial support. I, am, I fully agree. It's extremely important. If we want to invest and do, and do huge amount of investments uh, to decarbonize, we need uh, public support. And finally, we need to understand that it's very important because there's always the discussion of, okay, maybe it would be uh, more effective to produce these in North Africa or whatever. I mean, we need to protect the European assets and European jobs. This is very important. We need to uh, understand that the European, for instance, the European fertilizer industry has a huge amount more of innovation in terms of product development technologies, smart fertilizers, and fertilizers that are environmentally friendly and good for climate and good for earth, you know, than whatever is being produced outside. So we need to, to make sure that this, uh, this huge amount of innovation that the European industry is, is bringing to achieve fertilizers that are smarter, more intelligent, more effective uh, from an economic point of view and more environmentally friendly with less em emissions uh, to the earth, to the ground, to the ground waters. I mean, all of this, all of this amount of innovation has to be protected. And finally, it has to be protected also not only for the industry, also for this, for the European agriculture. Uh, 
the European agriculture is a key, is a key sector. We need to push for smart farming, for, for new technologies. And for that, we need a strong uh, European uh, fertilizer uh, sector in Europe with a huge amount of innovation. So transition is key. We need to the right regulation. We need a level playing field. We need to, to make sure that this that our we can achieve this ambition without uh, without being killed in the in the process and 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 we do under, understand that there are ways to achieve this and we are positive we're optimistic and uh, we believe that that uh, that uh, with a right dialogue with the, with the regulators we can achieve something that is good that protects the industry and achieves this decarbonization that we will need Jemaya. Electricity de France view what you know. I'm an electrician. I know Electricity de France for many years. An important piece of French economy. You've been a you've been a, a dynamo and a, and an engine of growth of France. What are your final remarks before the package? We'll see after the package. Um, two words: humility and and priority. Humility because uh, we see how complex it is and. Uh, there is a lot of uh, dimension to this project to decarbonize the industry. Uh, EDF is committed not only in France, but in, in Europe. Uh, again, we produce uh, 25%, a quarter of the uh, total low carbon uh, um, electricity in Europe. And we invest more than 10, million, uh, 10 billion sorry, uh, yearly in, in, in these uh, technologies. But clear priority. And here, I think, again, um, prioritizing the electrification and direct electrification is a no regret option if we want to, to avoid uh, uh, locking effects into uh, fossil fuels uh, technology. So that's why uh, while uh, remaining humble uh, when we look at solutions and testing many things, we should uh, have a clear priority, set of priorities and, and, and focus on the most cost effective way of decarbonizing the uh, industries through uh, low carbon electricity. Thank you for having me in this very exciting debate, Andre. Thank you. Well, thank you all for taking time. We went a little bit over time and, and you're all busy and all have other commitments. So I appreciate you staying a few minutes over time. Uh, on behalf of Mike Melling and, and myself, we appreciate this. This is in a way the pregame because the real this debate is going to come in the fall. We look forward to continue to work with all of you. We hope to be able to contribute in our own little way. So thank you all again, and thank to those that have attended today. And, and we wish you a nice weekend. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.